special program this year called Imagine Ireland. And we felt at a time of, of crisis for Ireland, at a time of obviously huge economic and financial turmoil at home, that it was more important than ever uh, to uh, present and, and enable uh, the artistic voices from Ireland, the, the cultural ideas um, coming out of Ireland. Um, in, there's a unique story to be told about the uh, cultural interplay and the, the mutual artistic influences, historical influences between the two countries of Ireland and America. It is a unique story. It's an extraordinary story. Many of the greatest artists uh, in American letters um, coming from Irish blood or from, from Irish inspiration, but equally the cultural impact of America on Ireland over the last um, couple of hundred years uh, has been at the heart, obviously, of the development of the cultural story in Ireland. So we wanted to chart that story, to explore the story, um, and to bring today's ideas to bear on that. So I can't think of anyone better to um, navigate through the labyrinth of Irish culture of past and present than our, our featured speaker today. Um, I, I won't uh, even go, go through his, his biography. You have it in the notes. It's very extensive. Um, he first helped me out, um, not at first hand, um, but when I was sitting my, my Leaving Cert uh, English exam, the kind of high school exams 20 years ago, uh, he helped me pass it with his, his book on Shakespeare, uh, me and several tens of other thousands of English students at that time. Um, but uh, he's extraordinary um, in that I think there are very few other guides who have dug so deeply into what makes Irish arts and culture tick, and from a first-hand appreciation of, of working with artists, of being with artists, but equally um, is one of the most um, penetrating critics of our society, our political times, the great, again, social, economic, and, and financial crises of our times. So in a gay, it's a chance today to perhaps bring those worlds together. Um, none other than Gary Hines, the director of the Cripple of Inish Man and, and the artistic director of Druid, uh, was on a panel with me a couple of months ago, and um, just as an obiter dictum, uh, she referred to our featured um, speaker today as the most intelligent man in Ireland. So I didn't, I didn't want to raise the bar too high, Fintan. Um, uh, blame Gary. Um, but uh, he, he has an extraordinary empathy for artists. No one writes more wonderful appreciations of Irish actors and, and traces the arc of an actor's performance and, and the particular, you know, unique expressiveness of an artist. And at the same time, it, it, you know, is writing a series at the moment in the Irish Times on um, five and six and seven thousand year old bronze and gold objects from Irish prehistory and what they tell us about the development of our of our own society. Um, so it's, it's a great pleasure to have him here. And with him today uh, is a cultural critic, a writer, um, and a playwright, um, who of course teaches here in the, the English faculty at, 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 at Yale University, but also uh, writes about culture and politics, again, straddling these two worlds for The Nation magazine, and has also had a plays performed at uh, the world's largest arts festival, the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, and also at Dublin Fringe Festival. So it is a great pleasure today to introduce Fintan O'Toole and Margaret Spillane. <clears throat> well, Fintan, uh, jumping off of uh, Eugene's mention of your series on uh, these beautiful Irish artifacts that have been discovered, um, usually when we talk about Irish culture, we're actually talking about the 20th century. And we're, we're starting with the great revolutionary ferment of the first decades with, with Yeats and Lady Gregory and Singh going on through O'Casey and Joyce and Flann O'Brien and so many more. Uh, but in the spirit of, of uh, what Eugene has just mentioned, why don't we do some considerable backing up Sure. Um, I suppose, first of all, just thank you very much for coming. Um, I always ask myself the question whether um, I would come to hear me on a beautiful Sunday, Saturday afternoon uh, when the sun is out and there's music in the park. And uh, I'm afraid the answer in this case is no. Uh, but uh, you, will, you will realize pretty quickly you made the wrong choice. But anyway, thank you very much. Um, I think you know, it, it is worth I, I, when I was thinking about this, I, I thought, you know, the question that everybody wants to answer is, why 
is Ireland, this very small place. You know, it's, remind ourselves, it's about, the whole island is about six million people. Um, why is it so disproportionately represented in, in international culture, um, particularly in literary culture, in poetry, in, in theater, of course, in, 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 in fiction, but also in lots of other aspects of culture, um, Ireland certainly um, punches above its weight. And why, why is that the case? Um, and everybody wants to know the answer to that. There are really two answers. There's, there's a very short one uh, and a very long one. And the, the short one is nobody knows. Um, <laughs> but that would be like killing off the, the hero in the first scene of the film. So we can't really give that one. We have to kind of pretend we know um, and hazard some sort of guesses. And, and I, because I've been thinking about this, because you mentioned this series I've been doing about objects and, and going right back to the first objects in Ireland and, and trying to understand it. And if you'd asked the question a century ago, you know, with Yeats and Lady Gregory and Singh and that great movement of, of, of modern Irish nationalist culture, if you'd said to them, what is it, what's distinctive about Ireland? What makes it so potent culturally? They would have given you a pretty clear answer. They would have said, well, actually, the reason it's so potent is because for all sorts of reasons, Ireland is has kind of preserved older habits of thought, older habits of, of mind. Uh, it's, a, it's on the edge of Europe. It's this place out there on the margin, didn't get touched by a lot of modernity, and therefore has this resource that other places don't. Yeats, in particular, would have given that answer very, very powerfully, very eloquently. And the more you look at it, actually, you realize that is a wonderful answer, and, and of course, it, it created fantastic art of people acting on that basis. But it's also kind of wrong <laughs> that, that actually, when you look at Ireland, it's never been like that at all. It has never, ever been a backwater. Um, from the very beginning, you, you, I think we think about Ireland's geographical place. You know, as we, you look at Europe, which is all the great civilization. And by the time civilization gets to Ireland, you know, it's, it's, it's way over on the edge. Actually, you kind of forget that for most of human history, the sea was the best way to travel. It was the best way of connecting things. Uh, traveling over land was pretty tough, but people could actually travel by sea. And what you get is you get this island which actually connects a lot of things. So everything gets washed up on a shore. That's what shores are like. And everything gets washed up in Ireland from very early on. And a couple of things just really have struck me about, you know, why, why might Ireland be distinctive? What's different about it? And the first is that it, it has this habit from very early on of absorbing everybody's influences. It's incredibly absorbent. And then reprocessing them and turning them into something distinctive. So it's not like there's this sort of fixed, authentic Irish culture that never changes. On the contrary, it's that it has this incredible capacity to take in whatever is going and try to make something new of it. So within a pretty short time, uh, you know, anything that comes into Ireland has been turned into something else. Um, and that's an amazing habit to have. The second thing about it is that it's um, what I call sedimentary. Um, and what I mean by this is that a lot of cultures, a lot of places, certainly in, in Europe, what tended to happen was you got a certain culture, a certain civilization, it got wiped out then by somebody else coming along and destroying it, and new civilizations being built on top of that. And of course, the great wipers out were the Romans. I mean, the first great globalizing, homogenizing power were the Romans, you know, who just kind of dominated most of Europe and Romanized most of, of European societies. This never happened in Ireland. Um, not because the Romans were particularly afraid of Ireland, but because um, they just didn't bother. They just thought, these wild people, and they didn't like the weather, you know. It's cold, it's wet, you can't get pasta, you know, it's like, geez, you know, stay away from it. So the Romans never, never really Romanized Ireland. But this is actually quite important, because what happened is one of the great ironies of history, that just when the Roman Empire is collapsing and Roman culture is on, on the retreat, Ireland gets Romanized, but in an amazing way, which is through ideas and through language. So Christianity is how Ireland gets Romanized. You know? It's not the legions coming in and wiping out the existing civilization. It's Christianity coming in. And it brings literacy. It brings connections to the rest of, of, of the known world. It brings new narratives, new, new 
visual images, new ways of making art, new ways of thinking. But it doesn't destroy what's there already. Um, this is really quite extraordinary. I mean, look at, you, know, you look at some of the stuff and, and, and you think it is kind of spine tingling sometimes. You know, memory is, is just there. It, it, it stays for incredibly long periods of time. Some of you may know one of the most amazing things in Ireland, actually one of the most amazing things in the world, I think, is, is, is a place called Newgrange, which is this it's a fantastic piece of art, um, which is a, it's a circular passage tomb that's older than the pyramids of, of Egypt. And it is aligned in such a way that on the winter solstice every year, and the winter solstice, remember, for ancient people, this is the death of the sun. The sun is on the way out. You know, the world may be ending. And every year on the winter solstice, it's aligned in such a way that the light, and only then, the light comes in and fills the chamber and is captured again. And it's, it's built like a womb, and the sun is reborn from, from this place. It's an extraordinary place. But in the 1950s, it was being excavated by archaeologists, and they knew nothing about this. You know, they, they just knew there was this big hill and there was a tomb in it, but they knew nothing about this extraordinary phenomenon. And they were down in the pub, where, where they would tend to be in the evening, and, and this old guy says to the, the main archaeologist, he says, you know, there's something about that hill the sun goes into the middle of it. And he thought, yeah, you know, they've been drinking too much and it's crazy. But the memory, this, this could not have been known visually for about 1,500 years. There was no physical evidence of this whatsoever. And yet the memory had remained. And this is what I mean by the sedimentary culture, you know, that actually the way in which things like writing arrived, the way in which things like Christianity, religion, imagery arrived, was such that it stayed on top of other stuff. So you have this culture that's multi-layered, and that's a very, very good seed ground for creativity. Um, just two other things I would say about it, um, it that, that are distinctive. One is that uh, it's a diaspora culture, of course, and again, this isn't entirely distinctive, but it's a very important aspect of it. I, I think there are a lot of parallels between, between the Irish and the Jews, for example, as diaspora cultures. You know. Our, Ireland is unusual to the sheer extent to which people have got the hell out of the place. Um, that's, that's what we do. And, and, that is also actually culturally, it's, it's tragic in certain ways it's for, for people, for families. Um, it's obviously in some ways a mark of economic failure, but culturally it's, it's extraordinarily rich because you always have this sense of connection, the sense of elsewhere, of an other, of another place, and back and forward connections all the time. It's a very connected culture. And uh, the last two things I would just say about it are that it's a culture in which um, Silence is as important as language. Um, everybody talks about the Irish uh, language, the Irish talking, the Irish love of language. Um, and I haven't gone on too long, I'm now talking about silence, which is kind of ironic. But the, it, it is really interesting that, you know, when, when James Joyce, Stephen Dedalus in, in The Portrait of the Artist's Young Man, sets out what's he going to do as an artist, he says, silence, exile, and cunning. And we kind of remember the exile, because that's what Joyce did and so many other artists did. We remember the cunning, because you have to be pretty smart and you have to work your way around things in order to be a creative artist. But the silence is a very odd thing for an artist to choose. And yet silence is a part of the culture as well, and not always in a good way. You know, this is a culture which is actually in some ways quite repressed. Um, you know, we, 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 keep, you know, we keep coming up with new stories from the past which haven't been told because we don't talk about a lot of stuff. Um, there's a great, um, uh, uh, Charles Francis Murphy, who was around Tammany Hall in New York for about 40 years, he's one of the big kind of figures in running New York, um, never ever spoke at all. <laughs> he just never said anything, never wrote anything, never said anything. There was a famous story about when uh, at some public occasion, uh, there was the singing of the national anthem and they noticed that he, his lips weren't moving. And somebody berated him about this and said, you know, uh, how come Boss Murphy wasn't singing the national anthem? And his sidekick, because uh, Murphy didn't reply, <laughs> so his sidekick said, um, well, he wasn't being unpatriotic, he just didn't want to commit himself in public. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so there, there is that, but actually this interplay between silence and language is a very, very important and distinctive aspect of Irish culture, I would say. And the last thing, and this is bordering on bad taste, but I think it has to be said, which is that Ireland has had conflict, but not too much conflict. Um, I think culture is stimulated by conflict, but it can also, of course, be destroyed by conflicts which are 
which, which results in absolute destruction. And the odd thing about Ireland is that, it's particularly in the 20th century, you know, it's, 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 it's been a conflicted culture. It's had violence. It's had big, nasty stories. But that conflict hasn't ever been sufficient to obliterate existing cultures or, or to reach a conclusion, indeed, in many ways. So you've all those kind of very complicated factors which have fed into the way in which Irish culture has evolved. And I think one of the interesting questions now is, is, is the extent to which do we still have these factors and, and are they still useful? Um, and I don't think anybody's entirely sure about the answer to that. <coughs> well, we backed way up from the 20th century, but we can also look at the 20th century in Ireland and in this place with a small number of people, there have been radical moments of transformation. Um, I heard your dad on the radio a couple of years ago. And in, li in living memory, here is this person who is talking about a time when his own dad died at age two, when he was age two, of tuberculosis, because if you got tuberculosis, you were going to die. Yeah. And this is the 20th century. Yeah. Um, and the fact that he had to leave school at 13 to support his family. And then you were the beneficiary of, I, I'm presuming, of, of a decision that was made in 1968 to make secondary education free. Because up until that point, it yeah. wasn't. Yeah. Which sounds, it's, it would sound to us as though, well, that's a reasonable thing to do, except that it was transformational in terms of the number of people it pr propelled into a world of a, sense of a sense of possibilities, of confidence, of trying new things. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about that in terms of its impact on art. Yeah. Um, I think in, in, in some ways, you know, uh, one of the virtues of being a very small place is that you can see these transformational moments. Uh, you know, they happen in every society and every culture. Of course, you know, change is, is built into the nature of being human. But in a small place, you get a sort of very telescoped sense of the big story of, of what's, what's happening. And this does have a huge impact on, let's take theater, for, for example. Um, one of the things that happens is uh, you get bi a, a big story which is the same story for everybody, or at least for an awful lot of people. So in Ireland, say, talking about my father's generation and, and my generation, and I was feeling terribly, terribly old when uh, Eugene was talking about um, him having read my books when he was at school. It's terrible, <laughs> terrible. You feel very old very quickly in Ireland. But <coughs> it, 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 one of the things that happens is it's visible. It's just this big national story is visible. And one of the big national stories that shaped so much between, say, the 1950s, I was born in 1958, so in my lifetime, say, between 1958 and up to, say, 1990 or so, you had, in some ways, in the south of Ireland, and we'll leave aside the Northern Ireland conflict, because that's something else which we can talk about, but in the Republic of Ireland, you had really one big story, which was the story of the clash between tradition and modernity, you know, between an idea of what Ireland should be like, which was rooted in certain kinds of values and certain kinds of ways of life, Catholicism, agriculture, nationalism, you know, a sense of nationality, a very strong sense of nationality, and then modernity. So, so when I was born around that time, you had a very big kind of political changes coming in where people were saying, actually, you know, this, this idea of Ireland that it could work as an isolated, place that would be self-sufficient and make, make everything itself and you know, not have to depend on anybody else. This just isn't working. And the reason it wasn't working was because people were leaving. People were leaving in extraordinary numbers. Um, there was a book, like a, quite a serious book published in, in about, I think about 1957, 58, uh, which is called The Vanishing Irish. And it, it looks, you look back at it, it looks kind of hysterical, but it's kind of saying, there will be nobody at all left in Ireland by the year 2000. And it, you know, it might seem crazy, but, but it, it, it was an imaginable 
idea because the, the rate at which young people were leaving and old people were, older people who were left were not getting married because Catholic Church had done its work so well, people were so scared of sex, they weren't even getting married. You know? I mean, <laughs> Ireland had the lowest marriage rate in the world in the 1950s. So you had this kind of demographic crisis, and then there was a big, big change where, uh, and it was quite a courageous change, really. The, 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 the old guys, the old revolutionaries had to say, look, this isn't working anymore. So what do we do? We have to open up the Irish economy, particularly to American multinational corporations. We have to bring them in, give them low taxes, bring them in, and you get urban life, you get industry, you get a whole kind of change, which, which I'm very much part of. But in terms of art, this story becomes tragedy, for example. You can actually write tragedy in Ireland in the 1960s in a way that I don't think you can write classical tragedy in any other English-speaking country in that period. As classical tragedy comes from, you have two ways of looking at the world, and they're both right. You know? In, in, the, in the Greeks, you know, there's the ways of man and there's the ways of the gods, and they both have a logic, and people act according to that logic, and at some point, those lines are gonna cross and somebody's gonna die. That's, that's what tragedy is. And you, can, you get that in Ireland. You get people writing classical tragedies in Ireland in the 1960s. You know, a play like Tom Murphy's play, um, A Whistle in the Dark, for example, is just completely classically tragic. And it's not because he's trying to be Greek, it's because the story of you've got some people in that play whose world is shaped by an older way of looking at the world, and then you've got the sort of young guy who has gone to England who's trying to be just a modern man. He just wants to live in a house and have a wife and get a job in a factory. And his, his father and his brothers don't, don't live that kind of life. And somebody's going to die. You know? so, so this <coughs> clash between tradition and modernity, I think, becomes a story in a way that, say, on, in the theater, what you can do is you can have a story which is about people. It's not a big political abstract play. It's, it's a play about people's lives. But everybody knows that it's also about them. You know, it, it, it has that resonance for people because it's playing out conflicts that are in people's heads and, and in their lives, in their daily lives. Can we stay on Tom Murphy for sure. a moment? Um, and maybe, maybe uh, Tom Murphy and, and John B. Keane at the same time, because within a couple of years of one another, at the beginning of the 1960s, each of them wrote a play that probably couldn't come out of, couldn't have been written 10 years earlier, that was part of what, what you refer to in your book is the first uh, boom in Ireland. Yep. The first time there's, there's a, a kind of economic explosion of possibility. And Tom Murphy writes this play about a, a fellow trying to have a nice middle class life in England and his family members come over and it was shocking to Irish people because Deeply, the yeah. Irish people were very impolite, shall we say. <laughs> uh, and yet, uh, the, the British uh, critics talked about it in terms of a personality that they projected onto the playwright, of a, of a, a person who was not like that at all. Yeah. As if he was, he, I think one critic said he could, you could take a look at him, he could handle himself well in a brawl. Uh, and, and that the personality was in the forefront, or, or an imagined personality of the Irish playwright as a character. Uh, but he created this really frightening world of an Irish family, at, this, at this, more or less the same time that John B. Keane was creating a, a rural story of, of violence and tragedy, The Field, yeah. which, which most of us who know it here know it as uh, Jim Sheridan's film. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about why those disruptive and violent and very clear portraits of two different kinds of Irish life came out at, a, at, at this time of, of economic change? There is an amazing relationship, as you say, between economic change and political change that, that's kind of fueling that and artistic change. You know, it, it's almost too pat. You know, it's almost if you if you were to write some kind of Marxist thesis about the relationship between economics and art, you know, it's particularly in the 1960s and 70s in Ireland, it's just, as you say, it's just so stark because you get, they start a new economic policy of opening up the country to international investment in 1958. In 1959, you get Tom Murphy 
you got Brian Friel, you got John B. Keane, you got a whole rake of extraordinary playwrights suddenly emerge, and they're all, all in their in their twenties. Mm -hmm. And they're all writing these extraordinary plays, which are these public plays in a way, about you know, what's, what's at the heart of this? What does it do to us? Um, and in a way, they're, they're sort of contradicting um, and complicating the politics. So what the, what the politicians are saying is, look, we can do this. It's OK. You can, you can change the country. You can bring in investment. You can bring in factories. You can move from being a rural society to being an urban society. But it'll be OK. We'll still be Irish. Nothing, nothing will, will really change. And of course, everybody knows it is going to change. But, but nobody can say it. Journalists can't really say it. Politicians can't say it, don't want to say it. Economists can't say it you know, and don't want to say it either. Who can say it? Well, the only people who can say it are the artists. The artists are the ones who can say, actually, life is not like that. You know? Life doesn't work in those kind of smooth ways. If you're going to change the nature of how you live and what your values are, it's going to affect you right in here. It's going to affect the way people think about themselves. And it's going to affect them in a way that uh, it, it'll come down to this very basic idea of what's right anymore. You know, what, what, what should I do as a person? And this is where you get the tragedy. You know, the fields, if, 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 if you know it from the film, I think the film kind of captures the essence of it very well, but the field is, a, is in a way an incredibly raw, primitive story. I mean, it's like something out of a completely non-European, non-underdeveloped society, you know, it's, because it's simply about a field. You know, it's about this guy who has worked a field small field. He's a small farmer. He's worked his field for years, but he doesn't own the field. And the field is for sale. The woman who owns the field is gonna, has to sell the fields because she's old and she needs the money. And this other guy comes in with a bit of money and is going to buy the field. And the guy who's worked the field feels, in a way, morally, you know, that this is my field. I, I've worked this field. And, but that's not the way the new world is working. The new world is this guy's going to come in and he's going to, it's a quarry and he's going to use it for industry. So it actually dramatizes this thing about agriculture and industry. And it, it, it just gives you this very raw, primitive story of what happens. And of course, what happens is the guy who's worked the field kills the guy who wants to buy the field. He just murders him. And, and then the second part of the play is what happens? Nothing happens. Everybody just stays quiet. Everybody knows what's going on and nobody will tell. So it's about silence, as I was talking about as well. You know? And you get this extraordinary sense that you get a playwright. Now, this guy who's writing this play right, is, is, is in his mid-20s. He runs a pub. He's, you know, he runs a pub in, in, in rural Ireland. And this play is kind of based on a real murder, which happened not too far from, from a pub, where the guys who did the murder, everybody knew who did it, but they were never prosecuted. So there's a kind of courage involved in this sort of stuff in a small society. I mean, we were talking about the benefits of a small society, but it requires a lot of guts. I mean, it's like somebody in New Haven writing about something that happened here, say, five, six years ago, where everybody knows and nobody's telling. You know? and, and that sort of thing, it almost for people experience that as going beyond art. So people who went to see that play did, didn't really feel this is a piece of theater. I mean, they really did feel this is a piece of life. This is actually about who we are and what we think and, 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 and what our values are and, and what's happening to us and, and can we make sense of it. And I think, you know, I was using the analogy of Greek tragedy and it's, it's not a ridiculous one because, you see, art doesn't actually give you answers. It, it, it doesn't tell you what your values are. It doesn't give you, it doesn't say it's okay, we can, we're at the end of this now, we'll package this all up and, and here, is, here is the future, here's the solution. But what it does do actually is I think it gives people courage. It, 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 it breaks the silence in a way. It just expresses what the tensions, the deep-seated tensions within the society are, and it allows people to experience those tensions, you know, to experience them as something outside of themselves for, for a while. You sit in the dark and you look at them, and they become part of your own experience. And I think this is psychologically an enormous gift that artists give to societies. You know, they actually allow us to, um, to process tough stuff that otherwise would remain unprocessed. But no, the whistle, A Whistle in the Dark was submitted to the Abbey Theatre. And not only was it rejected, but the rejection letter came with a letter excoriating the playwright as a vile person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but at, at the same time, the person who wrote that letter, Ernest Blythe, yeah. 
uh, very conservative, very restrictive in the sense of what Irish culture, what nationalistic culture should look like. He's also the person who is responsible for Ireland's becoming the first country in the world to have a state-subsidized national theater. Yeah. You see, I suppose what's happening there in a sense is, so, so you're absolutely right, but Ernest Blythe does write, I mean, Tom Murphy told me about this, you know, that he got this letter <laughs> saying, that sort of excoriated wealth said, there are no such people in Ireland as are in your play, you know, which is, which is a great sort of, it's the great official idea, isn't it, you know, that there is an Ireland and it does not consist of the kinds of people who are in your play. Um, <laughs> and therefore, obviously your play is wrong, you know, because we just we can't do this. But, but you're right about, you know, you know there is a, um, a, a kind of paradox, right? So, so Ernest Bly, just explain this guy, he was part of the revolutionary movement in the early part of the, of the century, um, was the first minister for finance when, in the new state. And then, you know, when, when that government went out of office, um, the, the, so he's like the secretary of the, of the treasury, you know, he's a big, big political figure. They make him the head of the Abbey Theatre, you know. Now, you don't do this unless you take the theater seriously, actually, you know, which is, this is dangerous stuff, and somebody has to be in charge to make sure that they're not causing trouble. And Blythe's basic job was, well, he was, he, perhaps he was a more complicated person, but his main job was to say no, right? So, so all of the really good playwrights who emerge, say, in the 1940s and up to the very end of the 1950s, and even into the 60s, you know, they just don't get done in the Abbey. Uh, uh, Brendan Behan, for example, John B. Keane, who we were talking about, Tom Murphy, Thomas Kilroy, you know, you, you could list. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was the Abbey's centenary, and I suggested to them, half in earnest, half in jest, that it'd be much better to put on a season of plays the Abbey rejected rather than actually put on the ones that they did. But, but why is this stuff serious? Why did they take it seriously? Well, you've got to come back to the sense that actually this is a society which is malleable in a way, is fluid, and is impressionable in a way. And, and the, the cultural images matter because people don't really know who they are. And, and, and having sort of awkward artists telling them who they are is a really dangerous thing in, in, in a political society. Um, and I suppose a simple way to get at this is, um, have you heard of the 1916 Rising? So people, you know, it's a, it was the big thing, it's the big kind of mythic moment of modern Ireland, the creation of the modern Irish state, right? Which is where, uh, in 1916, the middle of the First World, First World War, which is obviously, a, you know, a huge, epic conflict, uh, a small number of people in Dublin decide that they're going to use the opportunity of the First World War to stage an insurrection in Dublin. And there's only about a thousand of them, and they take over a couple of public buildings in Dublin, and they last for about a week against the British Army, and then they're all shot, or well, the leaders are shot, and that's it. And they think this is over, you know, it was just a few lunatics. Most Irish people didn't support them at all. But once they shot them, of course, <laughs> the Irish being wonderfully perverse, once they were shot, they were heroes, and, and, and had an enormous effect. It was very interesting, the only person who warned the British government not to shoot them was a playwright, was Bernard Shaw who of course had huge, um, was a very, very famous man in England and you know, was listened to and published. And Shaw wrote brilliantly saying, if you shoot them, you, know, you, you, are, you, are, you have no idea what's gonna happen, right? You're gonna lose Ireland. Because once you shoot them, they, they will turn from being sort of extremists who have you know, messed up our city to just being martyrs and being heroes. And it was interesting, the playwright knew this and the politicians didn't know it. But if you, there's two things about this, right? One is think of, most of the people who were shot were playwrights. <laughs> they weren't particularly good playwrights, but they all wrote plays. They were all completely um, extraordinarily involved in artistic movements, in language movements, in culture, in poetry, in putting on plays. Um, again, and I, I, don't, I hope it's not bad taste, but it, it, it is an analogy that's interesting. You know the way um, Islamic um, bombers now, suicide bombers, you know, make videos first, before they go out and, and kill themselves and other people. Well, Patrick Pierce, who, who, who leads The Rising, actually does a kind of thing like that, but it's a play. So there's actually a play which was put on two years before The Rising, which is about how I'm gonna be shot and I'm gonna be killed and people are gonna hate me. And, I got, and it's, it's absolutely extraordinary, this kind of close relationship between theater and politics. So one of the reasons why they take it so seriously is they know that this stuff actually 
is intertwined with politics and with the ways in which people see themselves and understand themselves. But they also know that you can't stop artists from being completely perverse. So the 1916 Rising is this huge kind of moment of, and it becomes this kind of great myth. And you know, of course, it used to be the great joke in Ireland was at, at, at one point in the 1930s, there was a, a proposal that Ireland should stage the Olympic Games. Somebody pointed out, well, actually, we don't have any stadia. You know, we're kind of poor country. You know? And we already got a place that doesn't hold very many people. And, and you know, the joke was, well, actually, you should stage the Olympic Games in the general post office, which was the center of 1960, because if all the people who claim to have been there in 1960 <laughs> actually fit into it, then you could, you could stage any Olympic Games you wanted. You know? uh, so it becomes mythologized. It becomes this big, big thing. It's like um, the 4th of July you know, here. It's a huge thing. Can you imagine the 10th anniversary of the rising, 1926? The Abbey, as you say, it's now state subsidized, right? Mm -hmm. You've got widows, you've got orphans, you've got the people who are, you know, the, 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 the bereaved of, of the guys who were shot are in the audience, the big, big play. And what is it? It's a play called The Plow and the Stars by Sean O'Casey, a new play, which says this rising was, was ridiculous. It was just vanity. And look at the poor people, the poor of Dublin are still poor, and nothing has changed. And, and it's a riot, and quite reasonably a riot, you know, because, you know, this is absolutely outrageous. It's a, most magnificent piece of theater, but it's an outrageous thing to be, to be doing in that context. But that's, that's the history, that's the tradition you have of, of contradicting whatever the myth is. So when it's the British Empire, when the Brits are still in charge, you know, all the, all, all the art is anti-British. As soon as you have a state set up within a few years, it's all anti-state, it's, it's all saying, actually, we don't like you either, you know. <laughs> and one of the odd things, and again, this is, you know, you don't want to be sort of sentimental about this sort of stuff, but like you were talking about the boom time in the 60s where, you know, the plays in particular are just astonishing in the way they attack uh, the values of the society and challenge the values of the society. But one of the great things that Irish artists have always had is enemies, you know. Um, like the Catholic Church was just really good at being an enemy of, of the arts, you know. <laughs> Uh, even having sort of Ernest Blythe, even having people saying, no, we're not putting on your play, and not sending you a rejection, but actually even the very fact that they would send you a letter saying, you know, you're a horrible, horrible person and no such people exist in Ireland, it means it matters. And, and, you know, there was a sense that actually artists had enemies, they had targets, they had, they, they had things that they had to deal with. And they couldn't be absorbed into the establishment because the establishment just didn't want them. <laughs> you know, was, and a lot of artists actually would be perfectly happy to be in the establishment if somebody gave them a lot of money and, and you know, they would produce propaganda and they do all the right things. But you simply couldn't do that in Ireland because they just censored your books. So you have to remember that all the great Irish writers, up to the certainly up to the 1960s, almost none of them are published in Ireland <coughs> because their books are banned. You know? So, so the, you have no choice but to be an outsider uh, and, and but to struggle and often to be an exile. But it, it does give an energy to the way in which artists have to relate to society. So they can say what they like in a way because nobody is going to reward them for being good. <laughs> so they may as well at least have the freedom to come up with all sorts of stuff, not just in terms of content, you know, the, the, not the kind of, but also in terms of form. You know, if, you, if you think about what they produce, Samuel Beckett deciding, actually, no, plays don't work like that. I'm going to do a play in which nothing happens at all, you know, in which there is no plot, there is no motivation. Um, or Flann O'Brien saying, you know, uh, famously, Flann O'Brien's first novel starts off with saying, I don't really think a novel should have one beginning at all, so I can't have three beginnings to this novel. You, know. you may as well do it because you have no audience. You have no, you have nobody embracing you. You know, you're, you're on the outside anyway, so you may as well enjoy it and, and, and try to create something interesting out of it. And that's, that's where a lot of the energy comes from, too, I think. Well, we've, we're, we're finally talking about uh, fiction writers. I, we've, we've spent a lot of time on theater. Uh, you talked about the, you've talked developmentally about Irish people. In, in terms of what is made manifest in literature over the 20th century. You talked about, for instance, the short story and, and the, a strong era of the short story and of that being part of the childhood and early adolescence of, of, of the uh, post-independence Ireland. 
Yeah, it's it, it's a very strange thing, you know, and, and I suppose this is to be critical of, of some aspects of Irish culture, you know, but but um, what you don't have, it's, it's because there's so much stuff, it's sort of you often don't notice what's not there. And to me, at least, well, if you talk about fiction, there are two extraordinary things which aren't there in, 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 in Ireland to a great extent. Obviously, there are exceptions. You know, we're talking in very general terms. But one of the things you would expect in, in a place like Ireland is historical fiction. You know, but there's no Walter Scott, for example, in, in Ireland. There's no really consistent, coherent body of historical fiction. And given how much stuff um, happened in Ireland, given that it is a small prism, you would expect that to be the case. So you don't have that. Why do, why do you not have it? Well, you don't have it because uh, the, the tribes never die. <clears throat> um, why do you get Walter Scott in Scotland, for example, writing about the old Gaelic order? Because they're gone. They've been defeated. They're no longer a threat, so you romanticize them. Just as you get Fenimore Cooper in America, <clears throat> you, know, you can start to romanticize the, the, the Native Americans because they're, they're not a threat, you know, at least in certain parts of America at that point. Um, in Ireland, the natives are never gone. You know, they're, they're, like, <laughs> you know, they're always restless. So you don't get historical fiction. But also you don't get social fiction. I mean, you don't get the English novel. You, you don't get Jane Austen. You don't get George Eliot. You don't get big novels of society. Um, you know, it is very interesting. Like at the same time as, as, as George Eliot, for example, is writing in England about, you know, writing these magnificent panoramic views of, of, of a very complex society. You know, in Ireland you've got lesbian vampires. You know, the, the, the Gothic novel is, is what you get instead, which is all about sort of mad psychodrama. Because you don't have a society. You don't have a society that functions in that kind of coherent way because its upper class is different. Its upper class is, you know, is Anglo-Irish and, and doesn't want to relate to the rest of society. And, and that sort of those kinds of structures are not in place. But they, they, they still are not in place in some ways now. You still don't have a big Irish social novel. Ulysses, which is our, our great novel, is, 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 is a sort of magnificent series of short stories, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it sort of weaves together lots of different stories, but it, it doesn't present you with, with an idea of a functioning, stable society. It's all about movement, it's all about transition. Why do you get the stream of consciousness? You know, it's because that's the way things are. It's, it's unstable, it's fluid, it's in flux. And why do you get so many, why is the short story so magnificent? Well, because, as you know, you're saying, that childhood is, 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 is sort of the great, um, testing ground of, of the Irish story. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can retain some kind of coherence so long as you're a kid, but once you become an adult, things get complicated, and we're not terribly good at that. You know, there's still, in many ways, you look at the Irish fiction is still enormously dominated by, either by stories of childhood or by the repercussions of childhood. You know, if you look at, say, Anne right now or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. magnificently done, but that, that sense that actually you never get over childhood. Uh, and I think that's because the society has has remained so unformed still that actually the the adult public person functioning within a stable society just isn't available. And maybe now it's too late for that anyway, because maybe those stable societies don't exist anywhere anymore. You know, that, that idea of of the Victorian society is gone anyway, isn't it? So so maybe we just missed that boat, but we've done lots of other stuff. Well, the elephant in the room is actually a tiger. Uh, we have to talk about the Celtic tiger. Uh, and to let us try to move away from the kind of binary notion of wonderful boom years, uh, lamentable bust years, uh, with all kinds of bad um, first world hubris uh, uh, adhering to the former and uh, all kinds of, I, I, as you, you've even said, in some ways things are worse. But can we, can we also find the, the good things about the Celtic Tiger in terms of uh, the, the affect of, sure. of, of, of contemporary Ireland? Sure. Um, you, you know, it, 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 I suppose it's, it's important to and it's quite difficult when you're in the middle of a crisis sometimes to stand back from it a bit and, and get any kind of perspective on it. Um, and certainly 
writing journalism in Ireland is 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 amazing because it's you know it is different from week to week and the sense of catastrophe and fluidity and crisis is just so strong. But if you do stand back from it a little bit, um, it actually raises very interesting questions about the culture as well and actually about the role of culture. Um, I think first, firstly, it is worth saying that you know there's nothing wrong with people getting prosperous. You know, there's, there's a certain tendency now to talk about you know. Ireland is now um, a kind of moral tale. And it's kind of a pat moral tale, you know, which is Ireland got, got too rich and got too prosperous and got too self-confident and you know, hubris and nemesis. You know, it's the oldest story in the book. And that, that's all that has happened. But it's worth saying that actually prosperity is also very good for people. You know, it actually... Um, has really important psychological and cultural effects as well as economic ones. And some really important things happened in the 1990s, which we shouldn't lose sight of. Um, one of the things that happened is that, that for, for a while at least, forced emigration stopped. And this psychologically is a very important thing for a society that's had forced emigration for 250 years. Um, it, it seemed, at least for someone of my age growing up, that my kids could stay in Ireland or not, as they chose. You know, they weren't going to be forced to leave the country, <laughs> and that's kind of important um, and kind of wonderful. It's also worth saying that actually, one aspect of the Celtic Tiger stuff that was really good was what is the Celtic Tiger? Right? Okay, it, it, it was about globalization. Ireland became the most globalized economy in the world. And this isn't just a bit of piece of Irish hyperbole. You know, there's a kind of index of globalization that's done every year by, by foreign policy magazine here in the States, which is very um, academic and worked out according to very strict criteria. And you know, by, by about 2002, I mean, Ireland was, was you know, ahead of any other society in terms of economic globalization. And this did underpin certain good things. Right? W one of them is, Globalization is about having to uh, be quite complex in your identity. You know, having to feel actually, you know, um, my identity is open. And in, in, on an island whereby people have been killing each other for closed identities for a long time, this is kind of good, you know. Um, breaking up those kind of very, very narrow-minded narratives of who you are uh, ca can be really liberating. You couldn't have had the peace process in Ireland if you hadn't had the Celtic Tiger, oddly enough. You know, the, the Celtic Tiger underpinned that sense that actually change wasn't bad, and that, you know, that actually people could begin to think, of the, think about themselves in a more complicated way. Like at a very simple level, if somebody is working um, in uh, a big factory outside Dublin making Intel microchips, or they're working in Cork making all the Viagra in the world, because all the Viagra in the world comes from Cork. Um, it's kind of hard to tell them, you know, you know your problem is the Brits are oppressing you. you, know? <laughs> it, it, you know, the, things have changed. It, the, the world is very different. And one of the, 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 the Irish peace process can be summed up in one phrase, which is in the Belfast Agreement, the peace agreement, um, which is the most amazing phrase I think ever put into any international treaty between sovereign governments. And it, it says, from memory, it says something like, People born in Northern Ireland may be Irish or British or both, as they may so choose. <laughs> and those two words, or both, you know, it's, we know this. I mean, everybody, most people in the developed world have an or both. You know, most Americans have an or both. They feel American, but they also feel an affinity to, to another identity. Um, and most of us actually live with multi-layered identities all the time. But governments never acknowledge this because that's destabilizing for the idea of a state and you know, power and all that kind of stuff. And actually, one of the things that happened in the Celtic Tiger was that because of this fluidity and flux, it was OK to say, or both. It was OK to say, look, it doesn't really matter if you've got multiple identities. And that those multiple identities can be accommodated politically. And this was both fed by artists and, and reflected in the work of artists. So, there's, I have no doubt in my mind you know, that people ask, well, what good is poetry? Well, I'll tell you what good poetry is, actually. In, in Northern Ireland, where uh, 
you had a really vicious and intractable conflict. That conflict was fueled by language. It was fueled by the fact that people weren't speaking the same language. You know, what they meant when they talked about history, what they meant when they talked about identity, what they meant when they talked about Christianity and religion were very different things. And actually cliche and stereotype become reinforced during conflicts. You know, people become kind of stereotyped versions of their own identity. And the only people who were able to keep language fluid and, and, and moving in different ways during that conflict in Northern Ireland were the poets. And again, it's not accidental that Northern Ireland produced the most astonishing array of, of wonderful poets, and still, still does, um, during that period. So in a way, what happened with the, the, the Belfast Agreement was that the, the language of politics caught up with the language of the poets. Um, and so the, you know, the culture fed into it, but also coming out of that, you know, that kind of change, it posed big challenges for the culture. And uh, I think that's where it, it becomes awkward, right? That, that fluidity is wonderful, fluid identities are great, but you reach a point, and this is what happens in Ireland, I think, which is that you don't know anymore at all what it is you're talking about or what it is you're writing about or what it is you're attacking, particularly as a writer. It's very important for writers to have something to attack. And after a certain point, I mean, roughly around 2001, 2002, maybe after 9-11, you could say, you know, when the world kind of started to dip, the whole sort of Celtic Tiger thing became a form of collective madness and collective self-delusion and posed a huge challenge to culture, you know, to artists, which was, can you burst this bubble? Can you actually challenge this thing? And I would say culture wasn't very good at doing that, actually, because it didn't know what, what to attack. You know, it wasn't the old stuff of the British Empire or the Catholic Church or the state. It was this stranger kind of phenomenon, which was to do with popular delusion and madness and, and, and people not having a sense of, of, of who they were. It's very easy to attack and subvert fixed identities. It's much harder to try to challenge a culture in which identities are so fluid that people don't know who they are at all. And I think that became part of, part of the difficulty. Well, this past week, uh, you had a, a documentary film on Irish television called Power Plays, and you also wrote uh, an article for the Irish Times, both in both of which you were doing, uh, you were issuing the kind of uh, challenge that Yeats uh, issued when he said, Irish poets learn your trade. Uh, you, were, you basically said in the last 15 years, with all this prosperity, uh, where, where is the work? Where are the big plays? Yeah. The way that the last time there was an economic boom in the early 60s, these extraordinary playwrights doing plays on, it, it, that, were, that were public plays in the sense that they engaged with the lives their audiences were living. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting. A lot of people have seen the Martin McDonough play, have you here or you will see it. I mean, that's a very, very interesting example because I mean, I love McDonough. I think he's fantastic. He's brilliant. He's incredibly funny, very dark. Um, but isn't it, it's very interesting that McDonough is sort of the, the big playwright, if you like, who emerged during the last 10 years. But McDonough wasn't in Ireland. You know, he, he's London Irish. He's, he's second generation London Irish. And his version of Ireland and this isn't a criticism at all. He's, he's, you know, this is his version of Ireland. This is the inherited version that you get as a diaspora, um, the chi child of the diaspora growing up, is really a 1950s Ireland. So you know, if, if you look at, well, the, the privileged man is basically set in around the 1930s. Um, a lot of his other plays, you, know, you, you can't really tell, is this now or is it 50 years ago? Um, very deliberately, it's not about contemporary Ireland. Uh, and it's interesting that the most successful, vibrant kind of playwright, um, skilled playwright who emerged out of that, was able to become very successful by not having to deal with contemporary Ireland because he didn't grow up there, he doesn't live there. It, uh, and again, he's, I'm not criticizing for this, this is his reality. But for, for playwrights and other artists who, who were trying to deal with this place, I think they found it very, very difficult. And again, I'm not sort of, um, drawing up a hit list and saying, you know, artists have to do the following and they must tick all the following boxes and if they're not doing these things, then they're wrong. Of course, they respond to the circumstances they're in. But I do think for whatever reasons, they, they found it very, very difficult um, to grasp this sort of strange phenomenon that was going on. Um, it's very striking that 
the, the other big Irish cultural phenomenon of, of the, the last 10 years was, was river dance. You know? uh, and again, I love river dance. I'm, I'm a sucker. I, you know, I, I think it's, it's wonderful. But the great thing about river dance is you don't have to say anything. You know, it, it doesn't actually have to deal with any aspect of contemporary society. I'm not saying it should, again, but you know, it, it creates its own myth and it, 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 it enacts it. But it's, it, it has nothing really to do with the world as it's, as, as it's being experienced by Irish people over that period. So the question now is, you know, what happens? And, and I mean, I'm actually sort of terribly pessimistically optimistic, you know. The horrible reality seems to be that misery seems to create a lot of the, the, the great creativity. It poses the challenges. It actually says, look, you know, how come you had a society which had a fantastic opportunity to really you know, get over its, its, its historic burdens and, and, and screw it up? How did it screw up? And why did it screw up? And why couldn't we understand ourselves? And why did we think that our houses were worth a million dollars each? Um, and why were taxi drivers in Ireland buying holiday homes in Bulgaria? You know, what, what was going on mentally? Not just, you know, you can, we can write about the banks and we can write about the economics of it, but what was going on psychologically inside? Um, I think probably, you know, the next 10 years are gonna be a fantastic period for, for Irish writing and for Irish art of different kinds because they've gotta grapple with that. They've gotta grapple with catastrophe. And also, they've got to try to think a way out of it, you know, which is, what do we have now? Uh, and start from scratch. And you know, the one good thing is, we've done it before. You know, we started off, you started off, Margaret, mentioning Yeats and Singh and Lady Gregory. They started out, remember, creating a national theater for a society that didn't exist. There was no Ireland. There was no country. And they decided it was going to have a national theater, even though it didn't exist. And in a way, you know, that's what you have to sort of do again. You have to say, look, there's some other kind of Ireland that is possible. Let's try to create a national culture which will, <laughs> which will imagine it and, and help people to find their way towards it. Uh, and I actually think that it's going to be a very exciting period um, over the next 10 years. We might have nothing else. We might be starving, but we'll, have, we'll, be, we'll be reading interesting stuff while we're, while we're starving. Let's. Um Let's turn attention outward. Uh, I'm sure there are questions in the audience. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Go ahead. We have a mic coming. Okay. Wondering what you think of the writer Cormac McCarthy. Could you speak about him? Because sure. he drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I actually like Cormac McCarthy, so we're probably going to disagree. Um, uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure to what extent he, he sort of relates at all to, to Irishness or Ireland. I, I think he probably doesn't. Um, uh, and, and I, but except in one sense, I think what he has picked up from the Irish thing is, you know, one of the resources that Irish writers have always had is this sort of mythological resource, you know, this, this ability to mythologize landscape, mythologize people, uh, you know, to, to try to create um, a, a way in which you, uh, you, you, you take the ordinary and lift it up into this sort of mythological space. And uh, I think that's the Irish aspect of, of McCarthy in a way that, that uh, he, he does that. Now, I'd be very interested to, uh, it probably looks very different if you are American and somebody is mythologizing a reality that you actually know <laughs> than if you're outside America. And I think this is, it is true of all cultures, actually. You know, a lot of Irish people get very annoyed by uh, Yeats, for example, and say, you know, this is kind of mythological rubbish. It's not, you know, the Lake Isle of Inish, Inish Free never existed, and if it did, you couldn't live there anyway. Um, you know, so there's always this tension, isn't there, I think, between uh, the need to uh, make art more than reality and the lived experience of people who actually live in that reality and then sometimes find actually I don't recognize this stuff because it's, it's been so mythologized it has no relationship to the place I live or, or the history I, I, I experience. And it often depends on who's looking. Um, often the mythological stuff is more powerful for people on the outside than it is for people who are living, living with it on the inside. That's probably not a very good answer, but it's, 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 um, it's, it's the only kind of Irish aspect I can really see of, of McCarthy's work, in spite of his name. What do you think of you two as though from the Irish story or Irish myth or 
Um, I think you two are a really interesting example of, of what I was talking about in one way of this, this very deep resource in the society for just sort of absorbing influence and, and turning it around, you know. Like, in one way, you could look at you two and say, there's nothing Irish about you two uh, in terms of musical terms. You know, they, they basically play, it's still based on African-American music, isn't it? I mean, all rock and roll is still based on, on that, uh, that, that same template. Um, but on another level, if you're Irish, you can see that they do relate very strongly to an Irish tradition of, of song, of ballad, of melody, of storytelling, of trying to use songs to, to, to tell stories. Um, and I know they can kind of drive people crazy a, a bit, but you know, they have an ambition to them, which I sort of admire. I mean, it, it can become a bit sort of uh, hyperbolic sometimes, you know, <laughs> and bombastic perhaps even. But uh, I think there is something about the, the idea that they take themselves seriously. They get laughed at for taking themselves seriously, but you know, should we be so hard on artists who take themselves seriously? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. And, and I think there is, uh, that, that does relate to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Irish traditions. Um, you know, and again, I don't want to romanticize the, the sort of distant Irish past, but you know, there were two people who had power in, in, in ancient Ireland. And ancient Ireland, by the way, so the, so the interesting thing is ancient Ireland goes up to the 16th century. So, so really until, the Gaelic civilization is kind of killed off, really, by, by the Tudor conquests in, in, in Shakespeare's time. So what you have is you have an extraordinary continuity. So, so ancient cultural forms, which go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, really last as living things right, right up to Shakespeare's time, for example. But one of the things that uh, was very strongly present in that society was that there were two people who had power. There was, there was the king, or the chieftain, and there was the poet, you know, the filler. People were really terrified of the poet because the poet could um, write a satire about you. And, and this was actually like people died. There are, you know, there's, it's recorded of people dying as a result of shame, you know, that, that, that the <laughs> poet wrote a satire about you. you know. um, but also there was a crime. It was actually it was a specific crime in old Irish law to unjustly satirize somebody because it's such a serious thing to do that, that you can't, it's a power that you can't misuse. You know? so, so if I don't like you and I go off and I write a satire about you, uh, that's a crime unless I can show that there's really, you know, you've done something wrong and, and I, can, I can prove it. I suppose my, my point is that there, there is within the culture that very strong sense that actually um, music matters, poetry matters, theater matters, you know, what artists do matters in some, some fundamental way. It's not just entertainment. And sometimes that can, be, um, can become a bit, uh, a bit precious and a bit sort of over the top. But I'd rather have it than have a sense that not, none of it matters at all. Uh, you know, I think there has to be some sense of urgency in, 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 in what people do. The other good thing about you two, and it's a very simple thing, but you know, they stayed in Ireland. For people of my generation, that was really important. You know, we, we had no rock bands when I was a kid because anybody who wanted to make it, they just went to England. You know? Uh, in some cases, they went to the States. But the idea that an international, global, superstar band could live in Ireland was just ludicrous. You know? and, and, and you two broke that mold. And just, they just stayed in the place, and they're still around. And you know, they've done some really good stuff. Like they've, they've put a lot of money into a really great project just to give musical instruments to kids in schools, you know, particularly in, 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 in poorer schools. And it's, you know, so it's a nice way of giving back. Uh, we'd prefer if they paid their taxes, but uh, that's another <laughs> <problem>. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between the press and, and, and the culture and the politics. It's interesting to me, and maybe it's a fluke, um, that I believe you wrote for the Times, did you? I do, yeah. And Colm Tobin wrote as well, and Brian Nolan or Miles Nagopoulin or whatever we want to call him. Um, he wrote for the Times as well. I can't think of, a, of, a, of any comparable uh, institution in the US where, where, that, where the, the, the line between the art and the journalists was so porous. I mean, re respecting that everyone has to make a living, uh, and, and that's important. But, but how, what, is it peculiar to the Irish Times, or, or is it a feature of Irish journalism 
itself in yeah. terms of its relationship to the broader culture? No, it, it, it's a very good question. Um, James Joyce actually <coughs> um, tried to write for the Irish Times. He, he, he tried to be the Paris correspondent of the Irish Times, and they, they asked him to do one piece on spec. And he wrote a, an interview with a racing driver, and it wasn't any good, and they didn't use him anymore. You know, he was obviously he had no talent, so he, just, he, didn't, he wasn't good enough to write for the Irish Times. Um, but it is true, there is that very, very strong relationship between journalism and, 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 uh, and fiction, for example. A lot of fiction writers have, have, have been or continue to be journalists. And, um, I think it is partly, as you say, pragmatic. You know, you've got to make a living, and, and uh, it's a small country. Um, and making a living out of writing means you, you end up writing for newspapers or whatever. But it is much deeper than that. There's definitely a much deeper relationship in that I think it has to do with two things. I mean, one is this sense that there's a very strong relationship between politics and culture. You know? So somebody like me, I write indistinguishably, really, about you know, economics and politics on the one side and about cultural questions on the other side, and I don't really see them as being different. You know, they, they, they relate to each other very strongly. But the other thing, I think, is that um, writers in Ireland tend to think of themselves as being public personalities or public creatures, you know, that they have some kind of responsibility or some sort of role in, in communicating and in, in being part of a national conversation. Uh, I mean, Colm Tobin is a very good example of that, you know, I mean, so it, it's not, he doesn't, he's now wealthy enough not to have to write for newspapers, but he still would and still does and, you know, would appear on television and in, in, in political discussion programs as well as talking about c cultural issues. And, um, I think it does go back to that sense that actually that, that the, the art and the artists are seen as important and as being central, and also see themselves as having some kind of responsibility to engage in that, that kind of conversation. And I think particularly now, you might have thought, well, this would have faded over time. You know, this would be an aspect of the past, but actually it's very interesting where we are at the moment because if you look at Ireland now, all the institutions have failed. You know, people are really disillusioned with, with politics, the banks, obviously, um, a lot of the business elite failed. The Catholic Church, uh, which was a huge, I mean, it's hard to overstate the psychological shock to most Irish people of, of, of the revelation of, of child abuse in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church mattered enormously to, to very, very large sections of the society. And, you know, that, it's been very traumatic for a lot of people to, to, to deal with, with the idea that very large parts of the church behaved appallingly with, with, with this abuse of power. So who are you left with? You know, wh who, who's left in the society who hasn't actually let people down? And by and large, in Ireland, you say, well, actually, you know, the artists never actually let us down. You know, they, they've, by and large, as a group, they've tried to tell the truth, uh, even when people didn't want to hear it. Uh, they've achieved at high levels. You know, they, they, they function at very high levels of, of excellence um, when other parts of the society don't. Um, and they also have, at a time of confusion, the capacity just to articulate things for people is very, very important, actually, and it, it, it really does help a society. And actually, one of the dangers at the moment is, is maybe putting too much uh, emphasis on and too much expectation on artists. I mean, artists actually can't solve your economic problems, you know, as much as you would like them to. And there is a sense, you know, that um, I always say it's very interesting if you look at, uh, our, in, in Ireland, if you build a bridge now, for example, in, in Dublin, you can't call it after a politician. Uh, you know, which would be the old thing. You, you can't call it after a, a saint or a bishop because, you know, who knows what they were up to. Uh, so, you know, e everything now is named after writers, you know. <laughs> All the bridges are... Um, they, there's actually a Samuel Beckett bridge, which I think... <laughs> how could you ever cross it? You'd not be afraid that you just get stuck in the middle and sort of... You know. <laughs> and there's, a, there's actually... Uh, there's a James Joyce bridge. It was... Uh, while they were... Um, when they were unveiling the Samuel Beckett Bridge, uh, one of my colleagues was, was down there just reporting on it, and uh, some Dublin wag suggested, uh, just shouted out, you know what they should do? You know, the stretch of water between the James Joyce Bridge and the Samuel Beckett Bridge, they should rename that as the Stream of Consciousness. Right <laughs> <laughs> here. Oh. Hi, um, two questions. Um, one is, do you think that the, uh, the martyrs of 1916, do you think they turned their grave now with the state of uh, Ireland? The Patrick Pierce, James Joyce? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, Frank McCord. Yeah. Um, 
he got a lot of sl uh, slack from uh, writing Ash uh, Angel Lashes, uh, especially the Limerick people. Um, uh, but it portrayed uh, Limerick in, 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 you know, in the 50s and the 60s. Um, do you think it portrayed the right way? Sure. Um, in terms of the, the, the people who set up the state and the, the people who kind of gave their lives in 1916 and, and, and elsewhere, I mean, I do think they will be turning their graves, actually. You know, and, and, and there's an enormous sadness to that. And it's a very simple thing, which is that you know, the whole, that whole movement was about independence. It was about sovereignty. And unfortunately, at the moment, I mean, Ireland can't make independent, sovereign economic decisions. Um, everything government has to do now is kind of basically run by the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and as an Irish person, I, I find that very upsetting. You know, it's, it is actually, there's an enormous sadness to it. Um, you know, you only realize what independence is when you don't have it. You know, it's like the Johnny Mitchell song, you don't know what you've got, so it's gone, you know. And the shock, you know, the shock of, like last November, was just seeing just guys just coming in from the IMF and saying, actually, no, you're not doing that, you're doing this. And you, you can't, um, you can't, you know, well, I won't go on with it because we'll be here all day, but you know, what, what they're doing is really pretty appalling. You know, that, that, that Irish banks went crazy, right? And they, they borrowed vast amounts of money from German banks and French banks. But also German banks and French banks went crazy by lending it to them. You know, they, they lent vast amounts of money to, to, to really crazy propositions. And basically what's going on now is they're basically saying, well, actually, we have to pay it back. I mean, not, not the banks who borrowed it, not the crazy property developers and, and mad people who borrow the money, but everybody has to pay it back. Now, this is, um, it's the equivalent, if this was in America, we, you'd be talking about $2 trillion, I mean, in, in proportional terms. You know. it, it's, a, it's about 100 and, 105 million, sorry, 105 billion euro, 105,000 million euro for 1.8 million people who are at work. You know? So, so it, it is mad stuff, and I won't go on about it, but it's, it's, it's actually really quite upsetting. And that idea of, of sovereignty and independence, this is why we have to start again. This is why we have to actually really rethink, you know, where are we? And, and actually looking back at the example of, of the early, uh, early part of the 20th century when people did try to reinvent something is, is very important. Frank McCourt, um, I just really miss Frank McCourt. I, 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 I'm just really sad he's dead, you know, at a, at a really basic level. I, I thought he was a wonderful man. Um, and you've got idiots, you know, who attacked him in Ireland over, you know, portraying Limerick as, as, as poor uh, and always raining and <laughs> all the rest of it. And, you know, he told his own story. He told his own experience and his own family's experience, you know. And, and for people to come along and say, well, it wasn't like that. Well, you know, actually it was. <coughs> for huge numbers of people. And, and the insult to those people and to their memory, not Frank McCourt's family, but to, you know, to, 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 to the, the huge numbers of people who experienced terrible poverty in Ireland, the, the insult of writing them out and saying, that didn't exist. You know, it's part of this silence I was talking about, this repression, this, this, this inability to, to cope with it. And this sort of, it's, a, it's an, amb an ambivalent thing. You know, we don't want other people to look at us in our shameful state. You know? Uh, and I think this is a confidence question. You know, I, I think if you're really confident as a society, if you're really confident as a culture, you're not ashamed to be honest about the bad things in your society, as well as being very proud of the good things. And, and, and you know, I think Frank McCourt did a fantastic job for Irish people in, in, in terms of truth telling. Um, and I thought he was, he was a lovely presence at events like this. You know, he was just so, um, you know, he, he changed, there's a lot of paddy whackery around, you know, a lot of sort of, you know, the sort of charming Irishman, the drunken Irishman. You, you know, you mentioned it with Tom Murphy, this kind of stereotype of the Irish writer is a sort of colorful and mad and violent and, and falling down drunk. And, you know, Frank McCorpus is an absolutely lovely, intelligent, warm, meaningful presence for an awful lot of people. And he also encouraged a lot of younger Irish writers. You know, he was, he was such a fantastic presence for them. Uh, people like Colin McCann, for example, you know, learned a huge amount from, from Frank and, and, and were hugely encouraged by him. And this is, we, you know, it, it's a very simple thing, which I haven't said, but like one of the reasons why Irish culture is strong and Irish writing is strong in particular is because you have traditions. You know, why do people take up a pen? Well, they don't take up a pen anymore. Why do they, why do they start writing? They start writing maybe because they know somebody who's, who's written or they get some encouragement from somebody or, you know, there's a sense that actually 
you know, that guy used to live down the road. If he can do it, then I can do it. You know, that, that's, it's one of the good things about having relatively small communities of artists that they do inspire each other uh, and, and, and help each other. And, you know, Frank was a, a really terrific example of that, I think. Somebody up there. Can we have a mic over here? In conversations with James Joyce, uh, Powers quotes James Joyce as saying about the Book of Kells that it's the most purely Irish thing that we have. Any one initial page has the same essential shape as any chapter of Ulysses. Uh, clearly, Joyce saw a continuity of Irish culture Absolutely. over a thousand years. Yeah. And he felt that. And I think, well, okay. Um, it seems to me that the homogenation of Ir Irish culture began with the invention or the bringing to Ireland of the television. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, uh, after, after the television, we can go down to eat the peach, uh, and where uh, Neil Toybean's uh, secret is that he's never been to America. <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting question about authenticity and homogenization and, and Irish culture. Um, I mean, it's a very interesting point you make about Joyce and the Book of Kells, right? And there is a continuity. There's no question there is a continuity. There's continuity in terms of the convolution, in terms of the, the imaginative fluidity of, of, of the creation. And, um, but it's also worth remembering that the Book of Kells is heavily influenced in its visual style by Coptic monks from North Africa who, who, who end up in Ireland, you know. Um, the monastic tradition out of which the Book of Kells comes is very heavily influenced by, by the North African Coptic tradition. One of the Irish words for a, a monastery is, is dysert, desert, desert. It's the same root, you know. Uh, that's in Gaelic, you know. So the Book of Kells itself, remember, is it's an alien religion, this thing called Christianity, you know, which is, is, has come in. It's uh, all these people learning Latin. It's written in Latin. <laughs> um, its visual style is very influenced by, by all of these other um, sources. And what it does is it then, it's like a kind of nuclear, you know, they've got these fast breeder reactors, you know, where, where um, I was reading in the New York Times today about fast breeder reactors, they, they produce more fuel than they consume. Right? And that's what a healthy culture does, and that's what Irish culture has done, you know, and that's what the Book of Kells does, right? It consumes a lot of fuel. It's bringing in a lot of ideas and images from outside, and it produces more than it consumes. So it, it turns it into something else, and it, it then it, 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 it in turn becomes um, radioactive, if you like, in a, in, in a good way. It's, 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 it's giving off this radioactivity over the millennia. And similarly, Joyce, you know, it's not accidental that Joyce makes this typical Irishman a Hungarian Jew, you know. Joyce is, is, is very deliberately saying that Irishness is this very, very fluid, contradictory thing which is open. It's not a closed tradition. Um, there's a wonderful, the best sort of definition of Irishness is, you know, where Leopold Bloom in Ulysses is, is coming under attack um, in, in the Citizen episode. You know, the Citizen is this kind of rabid Irish nationalist is attacking him because he knows that he's Jewish. And uh, he's saying, well, you know, what, what's your nationality? Uh, you know, and he says, Irish, I'm, I'm, I'm Irish, I was born here. And uh, he says, so what is a nation then? And Bloom says, uh, well, it's the same people living in the same place. And then he thinks, he says, or again in different places. Because <laughs> of course he's Irish and he's Jewish. And you know, the Irish don't live in the same place and the Jews don't live in the same place, but they may still be the same people. You know, th that sense of complexity, that sense that actually it's full of contradiction, it's full of openness. And it's not about having this kind of fixed thing that you reproduce. It's rather about the thing that's fixed is the capacity to deal with the contradiction with the many influences and turn them into something else. So absolutely with television, with modernity, with globalization, lots of other stuff comes into Ireland in the 1960s. But by and large, it actually gets reprocessed. And I would suggest, I wouldn't be quite as pessimistic as, 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 as you perhaps are, I think it doesn't become homogenized, actually. You still know an Irish poem, you still know an Irish play, you still know an Irish novel, 
you still know an Irish painting. You know, but there, there's still ways in which Irish artists are reinventing and reusing stuff that goes right back, you know, way, way, way back, thousands of years back. It's still there. That continuity, I would say, is absolutely present. But it's a continuity of fluidity. It's not a continuity of putting something in a freezer and trying to preserve it. Because if, if that was what Irish culture was, it would be dead. Because it's been, remember, this is an island which has been invaded, where people have been oppressed, where their language has been taken away from them. You know, how does it survive? Well, it survives because it's not a single thing. Because it is this, this extraordinary capacity to deal with contradiction and to make something new of it all the time. Um, and I hope we still have that capacity. When we, don't, we don't know. I mean, maybe we've had this huge experiment in homogenization and extreme globalization, and maybe we won't be able to, to continue uh, producing more fuel than we consume. But I actually don't see any evidence that we can't. All the evidence suggests to me that you still have this extraordinary dialogue going on between the past and the present, and that most Irish art is actually deeply, deeply integrated into uh, the past. Just, like, just think of the traditional music, right? One of the fantastic things about, about Ireland. Vibrant, absolutely vibrant. You know? First of all, Irish traditional music, um, and traditional dancing, which it's connected with, um, comes from Europe, and comes from Europe a lot, quite late in the 18th century. Uh, most Irish dancing was taught by itinerant French dancing masters um, you know, who, who, who roamed around the Irish countryside in, in the early 19th century. Um, look at the music now. Who are the greatest exponents of, of Irish traditional music? I would say the greatest exponents of Irish traditional music at the moment is a guy called Martin Hayes, who's a, who's a magnificent, absolutely magnificent fiddler. One of those artists that just makes you smile the minute he starts playing. It doesn't matter whether you like Irish music or you don't, you know, you know, you don't have to know it at all. Utterly, utterly, deeply embedded in a tradition. He lives in Seattle. You know. Actually, he's moved. But he's moving back. He's moving back no, to no, Ireland no, now. He lives but... in West Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, is he? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. fantastic. Well, you are privileged. If you, by the way, if you ever see this guy, go, go and see him. He is one of the most wonderful artists you'll ever see. But you know, uh, th this is, again, this is why it's because of a diaspora culture. It's, it's used to surviving in different contexts. You know. Why are people still Irish Americans? You know? Because there's something there that they can appropriate. Sometimes it's after generations, but they can pick it up and they can, they can make use of it and they can connect to it again and again and again. And stuff doesn't get lost. You know, I, I, I'm not pessimistic about that side of it because the evidence is that the stuff doesn't go away. It just remains there somewhere. Um, and sometimes it goes into a dormant state. Sometimes it's not useful for a particular point in Irish culture but it will be picked up again. Somebody will, will decide, actually. You know that way that, that the Gaelic artists had of making something in 1000 BC? Maybe we could try that again, and it happens. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, or maybe two. One, two. Me? Okay. Um, yeah, Mr. O'Toole, I've, I've read your byline a lot when I was staying in Ireland, and uh, I like everything you said tonight, except the, I. I really am afraid that Ireland is believing a false narrative about the Celtic tiger. And this wasn't a national delusion. This was a fraud perpetrated on, on the society and other countries in Europe. And I think it's really important that they get the story straight. And capitalism does not have to be the way it was. And the, for example, the business community that, or the businesses that were invited into Ireland in the early 60s wasn't the same capitalism that was brought into Ireland in 1998 and 2000 with, um, with and, and if, from listening to you, I don't think you realize the way it's been going on in the United States. And you would see that this was imported into Ireland. And this, this wasn't a national delusion. This was a national fraud perpetrated on the people. And the people of Ireland are not responsible for this debt. And they're gonna lose their democracy if they decide, if they, if they don't repel this, they're gonna lose their democracy paying it off. And, and there's more than just people starving. I mean, they're going to lose the democracy. And that's, I don't know, that's all I said. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I completely agree with you. You know, I, I, I've written two books on this in the last two years. And uh, you're absolutely right. You know, there was, a, there was a very strange relationship between Ireland and a certain brand of American capitalism, which is this finance capitalism, you know, driven by, by um, financial products and, and all that. 
what happened was like a hall of mirrors, you know, where, where I don't know if you remember, there was a moment in the debates between Obama and McCain, the presidential debates, where McCain started citing Ireland as the way America should go. Now, God love him, he didn't realize that it was a bit late at this point. You know? <laughs> at this point, Ireland was going down the tubes. You know? But a very strange thing happened in that you had, Ireland got prosperous in the 1990s for a lot of different reasons, by the way. You know, it wasn't a simple story because it never is. You know, big social change, big economic change. There's a whole lot of things coming together at the same time. And one of them was, was a relationship with America, which was a very good relationship in terms of investment, but there was lots of other things going on as, as well. What happened then is a lot of American conservative think tanks then started looking at Ireland and saying, aha, Ireland proves that what we're saying for America is true, it works. Um, it's a simple formula. It's to do with no regulation or very light, light, light touch regulation and low taxes. And if you do this, if you cut taxes and you have no regulation, look, even Ireland, even the basket case that I was Ireland is prospering. It was kind of the ultimate backhanded compliment. It was like saying, you know, if even the Irish can get prosperous out of this, then this, this has to be a magic formula which will work anywhere. Now, this was kind of for internal American consumption. It was pure propaganda. It depends on people not knowing a lot about what was going on in Ireland, actually. But the problem was that because we're so globalized, we, we listen to what's going on in America as well. So a lot of Irish politicians and a lot of Irish commentators, a lot of Irish intellectuals started reading the stuff that the American right-wing think tanks were producing and saying, look, what they're saying about us is so complimentary. You know, it must be true. So therefore, we just have to keep cutting taxes and we keep, keep not having any, any, any regulation. So you got this completely circular argument, you know, which was Ireland was being used in America to prove a certain kind of uh, propagandistic argument about American capitalism. And what they were saying in America was being used in Ireland to prove that this stuff was, was right and was going to keep working forever and ever. You know? um, and that's often, unfortunately, the way so-called intellectual debate happens. And you're right, of course it's fraudulent. Of course it's utterly fraudulent. You know, that, and and it, is, it is astonishing that they're getting away with doing this. You know, I mean, basically what they're now saying is uh, all of this private debt which was entered into by people just out of pure greed. I mean, it was sheer greed. It was the idea of a fast book. You could, you could make a lot of money quickly out of, out of flogging stuff to people on the basis that you know, it was only going to go up and up and up. It was a pyramid scheme, one of those. You know. But that the results of all of that should be borne by ordinary people, you know, that every single citizen should, should pay for this. Um, and you're right about it. it is, it's a democratic crisis. You know, it's actually a crisis of democracy. It's, it's, it's gone beyond being simply about finance or about economics. It's actually about community. It's about democracy. It's about the idea of whether you can control your own destiny. And this is the conversation I hope we're having in Ireland now. Um, and, and it is a conversation in which the artists have a very important role to play, actually, because it's not abstract. You know, it's about how do you think? How do you think about values? How do you think about who you are? How do you think about what you want? And the, one of the things we've got left is that you know, we've got this capacity to imagine and to imagine something different. We have just one more question. Thank you. Um, more of a comment uh, than, well, it may perhaps lead to a question, but uh, in regards to the earlier uh, conversation regarding homogenization and television, you could see, uh, at least with two contemporary playwrights, Martin McDonough and Connor McPherson, who is, by the way, a playwright, I think, who does speak very much towards uh, contemporary Ireland. But they've been moving into um, films, which I think is a very important uh, era of, uh, well, mass-produced art, globalized art, that I think Ireland is perhaps only now beginning to feel its, its, its way into uh, perhaps a more full participation. So I'm wondering if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I mean, um, I think what you will find, um, and it's not untypical of, and it's, again, it's one of the relatively vibrant things about Irish culture, is that uh, <clears throat> a lot of artists work across forms. So uh, there are people who are only poets, and there are men and women who are only playwrights, or who are only filmmakers. Um, but a, a lot of people typically, again, I think it's one of these, these things about the cross-personalization in, in a small society, uh, is that people want to work across a range of different forms. 
and they can bounce off each other in, in interesting ways. I mean, Martin McDonough actually is a very good answer to the, the notion that you know, bad television melts your brain. A huge amount of Martin McDonough's plotting is based on bad television. You know, this is a guy who didn't go to university, left school when he was 16, sat at home, he's every parent's nightmare, you know, <laughs> sat at home watching Australian soap operas. You know. And if you look at a Martin McDonough play, his plotting, it's old fashioned plotting and it's absolutely brilliant. You know. He is one of the great kind of storytellers and it's, there's nothing innovative about it whatsoever. It's just good old fashioned you know, stage craft, what happens on stage, people going on and off stage in terms of the way a story is told. And a huge amount of it comes from watching an awful lot of soap operas. Um, so, you know, there may be something to be said for those of you who are of my age or older who are in despair about your kids sitting in front of, video, you know, watching video games, all, playing video games all day. Maybe something comes out of this stuff, you know. Um, and film, I think, you know, every vibrant culture should have its own film culture. You know, it, 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 it's just part of the portfolio of, of modern identity. Um, and I think it's a real problem and a real pity in Ireland in a way that we, we haven't been able to sustain an indigenous film industry. It's a real problem when you've only got that small number of people. It's one of the downsides of being small, that it's not easy just to make films for Ireland. Uh, so every Irish film has to pay its way internationally. That means you, you start telling stories which, which perhaps appeal at a different kind of level. Now the irony of this, I think, if people kind of realize that is that actually I think you know, Ireland's never going to be making the X-Men or, or Batman Returns, and shh, God knows, shouldn't be. What can it do? It can, it can actually tell stories. You know? And I, actually, what we know from theater, from, from fiction, is that if you just tell stories about your own place and your own people, uh, they will make sense to other people if they're told with enough integrity, with enough wit, with enough skill. Uh, and I, I just think there's a there's a phase Irish filmmaking has to go through where we just start saying, let's just make simple films about stuff going on around us. Like there was a lovely film there a couple of years ago called Once. I don't know if people saw that. And it's, you know, it's a very simple film. It's not big Hollywood blockbuster. You know? And it was made just by, by Irish filmmakers in Ireland for Irish audiences. But actually then it became reasonably successful. It's not about having to make billions. You know? It's just about can you make enough money so that you can do it again? And, and um, you know, I, I would like to see that happening. And, and I think you know, the, the playwrights, for example, going into wanting to direct films or make films is, is not a bad thing, actually, because one of the great weaknesses in American film, dare I say it, is you know, the denigration of the writer. You know, the, 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 the famous Hollywood quip about the, the uh, starlet who was so dumb she slept with the screenwriter. You know, it's like it's, it's the, <laughs> you know, it's the, 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 lowest, the lowest form of of life, um, and actually, one of the distinctive things about about Irish cinema, such as it is, is that uh, actually writers are very important because it's it's the the creativity is often come from the writers, and it's not you know it's not accidental that best known Irish film directors are writers. You know, Jim Sheridan, whom we mentioned, you know, is a is a writer, started as a playwright. Neil Jordan uh, is still a fantastic novelist. I mean, Jordan just published a really good novel, you know, and uh, and keeps writing novels. He writes a novel every couple of years, so you know the if there is going to be anything distinctive in Irish cinema, it's going to be that it's cinema made by writers. <laughs> and, and what does that do to cinema? Well, it, it might be where the interesting stuff is. That's the distinctive stuff we have. We don't have um, Hollywood. We don't have a lot of money. We don't have, well, we have some te technology, but the technology will, will end up in, in, in Hollywood. I mean, the guy who did all the um, animation for um, Avatar is from Dublin, you know. Uh, and learned his trade in, in, in Ireland as a very good kind of animation, in Ireland as a very good kind of animation industry there. But it's never going to be big enough that if you, if you want to make Avatar, you're not going to make it in Ireland. You know? So you just kind of have to accept that a lot of that technological stuff is going to go somewhere else. What you come back to is the, is the simple direct stuff that the writers can do. Um, so I think that's, that's the unique selling point. Thank you, Fintan. <laughs>